Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. I'm so happy that you're here. My goal with this channel is to bring motivational speakers to the mic with the intention of inspiring and uplifting you. We hope you enjoy. Hello. I'm so happy that you are joining for this discussion with Kirsten Berg. Man, I'm so excited for you to listen to this. And, you know, a part of me, I want to tell you what her Instagram name is. It's at Kirst Berg. So at K-I-R-S-T-B-E-R-G. And you can also find her at her website, www.kirstenberg.com. And I, a part of me, I had not, well, it's been a little while since I looked at her Instagram page. And so having this discussion and the way that she describes some of the artwork that she's put together for large installations in San Francisco and at Burning Man, uh, I just now, after having the conversation with her, I'm creating this intro, went and looked at her page again, and I'm just blown away at the artwork that she puts together. It's incredible to have the opportunity to hear her explain it the way she does. I'm just really inspired. Like I want to go and I mean, there's, uh, there's no way I could create something like what she makes just because you got to check it out. Go have a look. And listen to this conversation with Kirsten Berg. All right, let's get started. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I'm um, having my uh, office hours at, in my car at the beach in Santa Barbara uh, right now, this week. So I'm, I have no complaints at the moment. Nice. Well, I hear you. What, yeah. what is the weather like over there right now? I've, I've been hearing things about drought conditions in California. What, what, is, it, what is it like there? Uh, yes, it's a very dry w- year, which is very worrisome for the summer as we go deeper into it. Um, right now, the, uh, I kind of escaped to Santa Barbara from the Bay Area to the, the cooler, marine, foggy climate, and it seems to have hunted me down. So uh, right now, it's cloudy yeah. and foggy here, yeah. which... Uh, People do seem to appreciate and when you have uh, you live in a super sunny, dry environment, it's a, it's a, it's a welcome change. Good point. We have, yeah. we had a, an increase of rain lately where we were in a little bit of a drought here in Florida. And then this last week, two weeks, it started dumping again and everybody's like, Oh, thank yeah. goodness. Have a little bit of moisture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, it's very dry in California. It's, 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 it is, it's serious. Yeah. I know, right? I keep watching it thinking, all right, let's see what happens here. I know. Um, and yeah. I'm, I'm really appreciative to our mutual friend, Cliff Samuels, for introducing us. And uh, for me, I'm excited to get a chance to get to know you and through, through our conversation. And I guess a good starting point where I'm curious is how long have you been practicing yoga? And, and I know you're an Ashtanga teacher. When did you get started practicing Ashtanga? Uh, so I was, uh, you know, in and out of the San Francisco Bay Area uh, growing up as a kid in the 70s between the Bay Area and Amsterdam. And it was like really this like, uh, you know, the post um, 60s social revolution and, mm. uh, you know, all things India were of interest and there, were, there was yoga everywhere. So it's kind of. I was very used to it as a kid and people like to say, Oh, I, you know, I did yoga in my mom's belly. And, <laughs> but, and I, I joined my mom for a few yoga classes was when I was a kid. And apparently I was a disruptive presence, but um, <laughs> I, I was always interested in India and I knew even like, even as a kid, like I'm going to go to India. Like there's something there for me. Like I just like sort of knew it in my bones. And I yeah. thought it, even as a kid, I thought it was weird. I'm like, I, why do I want to go to India? But, um, Eventually, I made it over there, and um, how, how, old were, tried, how old were you? I didn't get over there until I was twenty-three, nice. and I looked around for yoga classes that were that suited me, that really resonated with me, and I didn't find them. But what I did find was 
I really connected with the uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, mm. meditation community. So I took that on as my, like meditation was my focus for years. And then, you know, in the meantime, when I returned back to the States, I kind of tried like anger yoga and Kundalini and, uh, you know, nothing. I, I just figured, you know, I, I had to go back to India and take time and find a practice that spoke to me or the right teacher. And nice. eventually I did. I just, I bought a one-way ticket to India. I saved up enough to be able to stay away for a few years and kind of let myself meander and give myself the time to check out different teachers. I ended up in Rishikesh and uh, Dharamsala. Nice. And so that was later when I was... Um, in 1996 and you know i met a teacher that i absolutely adored but he was somebody that would just do like a few workshops and immersion a year he wasn't an ashtanga teacher at all and but through him i um was directed to an ashtanga teacher in goa which was um uh, ralph nayokat oh. uh, yeah and eventually we um i i ended up I just knew, like, with, with my first Ashtanga practice, oh, this is it, this, this really suits me, that it's self-guided, that there's a focus on slowly building up a practice uh, rather than just jumping into something and, like, having, you know, having to try to do everything yeah. all at once in yeah. 60 minutes or two hours. And I like that there was an emphasis on breathing and uh, visual focus, the drishti, like, uh, it just made sense to me. So oh, I, I stuck around for six months and then I went to Mysore and visited. I studied with Patavi Joyce. And when I was in Mysore, uh, Rolf ended up there as well. And sort of, you know, I, uh, I ended up going back to Goa and living there and returning to Mysore every year. After nice. That. So. Yeah. I, didn't re- I didn't realize all that. I'm so excited. Yeah. Ra- Rolf was uh, both my wife, Tamara, and I's first uh, Ashtanga teacher. Oh, delightful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I such know. A, I such know. a kind teacher. I know. And that's cool. I didn't realize that you that you were stationed in Goa, too, for, for that amount, that you spent so much time there. Yeah, I ended up living there for four years. Wow. In fact. That's all. What was that like? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, uh, to be quite honest, I, some people really connect with Goa and some really are repelled by it. And I was uh, of the latter persuasion. Uh. I, I loved India and I really disliked India, uh, Goa. And I, it, you know, it, over the four years I was there, that, that didn't really change. I felt that there was like a lot of darkness there. And the, mm. the longer I was there, the more... Um, I came to learn of, you know, what life is like kind of behind the scenes. But I, you know, I was there for my own reasons. I wanted to focus on practice. Yeah, yeah. And I had a nice community. Nice. And um, so, you know, that that uh, those were outer challenges. And I kind of, uh, you know, took those on as part of my greater yoga practice. It was like, okay, these things, like, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm aligned within my internal practice I can kind of navigate my way through the discomfort and the mm. dislike and yeah. you know cultivate the uh, dispassion that we are that you know that we're doing practice for so for that's, me it just became part of my practice that's cool, <laughs> for Kirsten. four years yeah I, I until hear- I decided I had enough and I was like all right I think I want to live somewhere where the, <laughs> yeah. the outer environment is also <laughs> like feeling inspiring <laughs> in some ways like you prove yourself right like all right i can do this i can do this and yeah. after, enough kind of time goes by all right well, what's next like is there yeah so, i hear you we, oh, we, uh, we we went to uh goa for uh a summer to go practice with rolf and it was monsoon season and i oh. figured well i'm from florida so it rains here no big deal but uh yeah. it really rains there and a lot of people were like yeah. why are you why are you even here everybody else is up in rishikesh or somewhere else and, <laughs> and uh it was a really tough uh we were there for a little over a month it was a it was a challenging experience so i can totally yeah. understand what you're saying about the yeah. interesting elements of <laughs> of, <laughs> of the goa india what yeah. uh that's that's cool when oh, uh well 
Ha, huh, that's exciting. Are are you practicing Ashtanga every day? Are you still on a consistent daily practice? Well, God, uh, you know, I'm going to say no, I'm not. And uh, just for the sake of uh, like completely being authentic, I think a lot of, I know that a lot of people who have who were dedicated to a daily or you know like six six times a week practice yeah, for yeah, decades yeah. um as as you know you just go through the postures and also through aging and questioning you uh most most people i know are not maintaining yeah. a daily practice and not to like uh you know kind of people will w- w- could say, well, you're making excuses just because other people, yeah, and it's yeah, not that I'm just, yeah. I'm saying, you know, it's what I've noticed like in private conversations is that most people are uh, modifying the practice a bit or reducing yeah. the length or intensity of the practice, um, or perhaps not practicing daily for a host of reasons, but are afraid to say so because uh-huh. it's considered you know, you know, not the new Ashtanga way. And there's a really, there's a discrepancy between what we were taught when, uh, like decades ago and what is the, the current message. Like I've had students, uh, say like people that are like newer to Ashtanga say they started their practice within the last two, uh, 10 years say, well, I don't feel like I can be an Ashtangi. So I question whether this is a practice for me. And then like, what do you mean you can't be an Ashtangi? You're, you seem to be doing the practice. You're showing up. Yeah. Um, so like, well, you know, I can't practice six days a week because I've got a job or I've got a baby or I've got all of the above or, you know, I can only manage four or five times a week. And like, well, you know, we were always, we were taught, I was taught um, that, you know, whatever you are able to manage on a consistent basis, but that is also realistic, is acceptable. Mm. And the ideal is the six day practice, but the, that's, that's different. You know, that's, you know, if you're in a position where you have servants or nannies, mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't have to commute for an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, you don't have the same sort of relationship expectations that somebody in a different culture where the roles are very defined and very separated. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have that, then uh, it's it's not realistic to superimpose another culture's like you know very uh, delineated mm. uh, expectations upon yourself. And uh, Good point. one thing that I really appreciated about Achabi Joyce is that he was very kind and forgiving and supportive of people's uh, lives. It's like you know. If you can only manage three times a week, yeah. you do three times a week. If yeah. you find space for another day per week, you do four times a week. And you try to find, you know, time for that for that fifth practice for, and eventually, ultimately, for the six times a week. But if you can't, you can't. And yeah. um, there wasn't, like, a harsh, harsh uh, judgment about it. Whereas I, I'm noticing that people tend to judge themselves quite severely if uh, they're not able to maintain a six times a week practice. That's a great... Uh, that, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, in the last five years, I've noticed that there's a tendency for people to express that uh, doubt, and um, people are so relieved to learn that uh, whatever you can do is okay. So, as far as I'm concerned, like, I had a shoulder injury, and the... Practice was just seemed to be aggravating it, or at least it wasn't helping it. So yeah. I took some time off. I like fine. I'm just going to take a few months off and see what happens. Just let it all go. Yeah. And it just healed. Like I, I, I don't have this. Like you know, I thought, well, maybe I have osteoarthritis in my shoulder, <laughs> yeah. and maybe I have you know, like a bone yeah. or something. Like I'm aging. You know. I'm 50, it must be that, and it's not. It just, the body needed a little time to repair, and I went back into practice, and I found that the five or six times a week was re-aggravating it, so I experimented with, like, taking a day off, like, in between every other day, and that was fine. So sometimes I do, like, 
actually recently. So I did that for a year and I think that's what my shoulder needed. And, um, for the last three months I, I have maintained like a five times, sometimes six times a week practice and it's, it's been okay, but I don't do, I don't force myself to do like the series advanced A, yeah. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm doing primary and I'm very happy with that. So, I hear you. I, well, I, yeah. I, I really appreciate your honesty about that because I agree with you. I think that's important to address that all yeah. of these ideas and also I, I love primary too like I, I feel like yeah. I hit that point where I'm just like I'm so content and happy with doing primary series it's it's wonderful it's just fine <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's you know if you've injured yourself and then have had to start like build your practice up from scratch you realize that whatever the inner practice is is still the same whether you're like deep yeah. into advanced A or you're just halfway or I, I should scratch out just whether you're halfway through primary, it's the inner challenges and work are the mm. same. The focus on the drishti, the maintaining of the bandha, the mm. you know keeping yeah. the evenness, the steadiness of the breath, regardless of what asanas you're contorting yourself into. So, um, and that's like a really liberating realization. Like okay. it really doesn't matter what the asanas are at the end of the day. It's about the inner practice. Yes, I agree. Uh, awesome. Thank you. I, in the process of getting a chance to um, kind of like see what you do and, and where you teach and all that, I, I noticed that you are an artist and that you yeah. create amazing pieces of work, like large pieces of work. And then I learned that Thank you, you. <laughs> you've been able to display them at Burning Man. I have friends that have gone to Burning Man. I've never had the chance to go. I've heard incredible things about it. Like it's just an amazing scene and just seeing some of the photographs of what the, what the art installations are like out there. I'm just, I really want to go someday. And so on that yeah. note, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what, what are you working on right now? Art wise, are you working on any pieces or what are you up to these days in your art pursuits? Well, um, the reason I uh, brought myself down to the beach in Santa Barbara is because I am <laughs> recovering from having just uh, reinstalled one of my uh, large sculptures at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. And that was wow. uh, 12 days of standing on my feet uh, on concrete, you know, like 10, 12, 14 hours a day, uh, you know, with nonstop. So um, I just did that. And it's, uh, it's actually the first like real, like manifest piece I've done since uh, COVID started. I, nice. you know, I've done some smaller pieces last year. I did something like an interior piece. Uh, for a women's Biennale that was in Macau. And I was supposed to build like an um, in situ uh, sort of like residential, like massive piece, like go travel to Macau. And exactly when uh, all the lockdowns started to happen. So wow. instead of that, we, uh, everything got, um, you know, uh, sized down. So I did like a tiny piece yeah. for the change. And, yeah. but other than that, this is the first, um, this is the first installation I've done in in a while. I have other pieces um, that I'm working on conceptually and uh, figuring out materials. Like there's there's a private piece, a commission that I'm creating for somebody up in Sonoma. Nice. Uh, sometime soon. And Burning Man is not actually. It's not officially happening this year, but uh, there's a sort of unofficial burn that will happen. And uh, I went last year as well, and people brought like smaller scale art because the heavy machinery that you usually have isn't going to be there. So I'm I'm mulling over the possibility of creating something that's sort of like a, a sculpture, but wow. something I can stick in the back of a, a truck and set <laughs> yeah. up with a, few, with a few hands and without like a forklift and a scissor lift and all of that. That's amazing. So the the one that you just did in San Fran was, you said you spent, how, to, how many days you were working on it? For seven, 14 days? 12 days. 12 days. Great. And yeah. what, what kind of, <laughs> this, what, what kind of um, art, like what type of piece were you working on? I, I'm, 
I don't have a visual in my mind of like what what did the finished product look like. Well, uh, it was hard to um, it'll be hard to truly convey an accurate picture with words, but I'll try. It's okay. a series of spheres that are stacked upon each other in successively smaller sizes. So, um, what the silhouette looks like is like the Mandelbrot fractal and it also looks like the like the very top of like Southeast Asian Buddha heads. You've got the wow. bun with all the nodes and then you've got little a series of buns and spires and like it's sort of elongate the taper at the top. So if you can imagine that silhouette. Yeah. And then the main sphere that sits on the ground is about ten feet wide. Mm. And the stack of spires, successively smaller spires that taper up to an elongated point, those are another eight feet. So eight, Whoa. 18 feet total or about six meters tall. Wow. And these are covered with uh, different sizes and uh, depths of convex uh, circular mirrors. So everything is circles and spheres and um, it's all mirror polished or security mirrors and chrome hubcaps and um, even Ikea bowls that I've covered with mirrors. Like, And all of these represent uh, nodes of awareness and consciousness. So, you know, I'm inspired by the interconnectedness of, you know, fractal objects, the fractals in nature, you know, everything is a replicate of another thing and it branches off into further you know, ever self-replicating, um, awesome. you know, features, uh, yeah. small scale and large scale. It's, it's the whole cosmos, the micro and the macro, and everything is interconnected. And then the same with the nodes on the top of a Buddha head or the jewels that are described in, uh, you know, the Buddha Sutra that talks about Indra's net of jewels or pearls where we all hold and contain uh, all wisdom. Like there is no separation. It's all inter- mm-hmm. interdependent awareness and existence and knowing and consciousness that, you know, it's this, our tapestry of the collective self, basically. So nice. what I, with this piece, uh, the first thing that happens is people are drawn to the convex mirrors because you have this sort of distorted fun house like mm. effect, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, people like photographing themselves. So it's very much focused on the personal, the self, like how can I take my, you know, the best picture possible and put <laughs> yeah. it on Instagram. Yeah. But when you step away, you see this composite image. It's this like mosaic of shared reflection. And you see how the person standing next to you is also captured into your mirror and you're captured in theirs. And like each mirror has like a different angle and perspective which, um, you know, you kind of like wonder about that, like, oh, right, there's this effect of like all of us being like held together in this like framework. It's like the individual selves. Um, and so it's, it's, this piece is called Compound Eye, and it's eye like eyeball slash yeah. quote unquote eye. So inspired by the uh, faceted lenses of insect eyes where each wow. piece is a necessary part of the, the greater whole. Like we're all part of the bigger picture and we all belong in there. We're not separate, but um, you know, the, the whole can't be seen without each of our individual perspectives. Um, but we have to be able to step back and like actually step away from our sort of self-focused like obsessiveness and to see that bigger picture that it's not like, you know, Wow. There is the personal self that we're still embedded within a larger collective self, the, the, the great I. So. Nice. So Curious. all of that. That, that was a great, that was a great <laughs> audio <laughs> version. Okay. I actually, you know, because I, well, I, I want to go on your Good. Instagram page. I'm not going to do it right now because I want to focus and uh-huh. not, not pick my phone up. But I know, <laughs> are there pictures of it on the at Kirst yes. Berg? Yes. Site so yes. just so everyone knows it's spelled K I R S T B E R G on Instagram, yes. and that way we'd be able to actually then t- take a, a look at the the piece that you're speaking of. Yes, 
it, yeah, all awesome. it's all there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm cu- like, how many people are helping you put this together? Is this like a solo thing, or do you have a whole team with you? It is impossible to do like a large scale piece of art solo, especially a Burning Man, uh, yeah. where you have like seventy mile an hour winds wow. and you have dust storms. Um, you have whiteouts sometimes for like four hours and there, you know, you have to work on ladders and with heavy machinery. So it's a whole, um, so I always start with the concept myself. I do all the material research myself. I do the fundraising myself, you know, that's about like six to eight months, depending on, uh, and you know, what the project is. That's when something um, I was so curious about. Like when I see these huge pieces of art out in the desert like that, I just think how, how, fi- like even financially, like how does somebody's paying for that? So you actually do fundraising to raise the yeah. the funds to be able to pull off this, this piece of art. You do. I mean, that's what's so beautiful about the, uh, the art making experience at Burning Man. You're completely bypassing the art world. So whatever anybody does is really what they want to do. Mm. And it can be a solo artist, like, like I'm considered a solo artist because it's a single artist vision and concept, even mm. though I have a team of people that help me, mm. uh, actually construct the art, mm. um, behind the scenes, uh, you also have artist collectives that, uh, you know, they make decisions and create as a group. And so you get these like massive installations that are created by like hundreds of people. Wow. Um, and a lot of, I would say most of the artists, uh, put themselves into debt, uh, mm. from building art for burning men, because you can apply for a grant that you, the most you'll get is 50% of your budget mm. and the rest uh, the artists are expected to fundraise themselves. Wow. And that's part of the intention of Burning Man that people like reach into their community and get them involved in like supporting the arts, the uh, cool. art patronage, especially in the States because we don't really have such a long history of like art patronage yeah, and yeah. art in public places. So it makes it like even more exciting and like sort of, you know, feeding the soul because like American public space is so uh, devoid of, Mm. you know, like Mm. really riveting art or meaningful art. You know, obviously there are exceptions, but in general, we, we don't get to experience that. Um, That's so so interesting. I I agree. I think, well, you, you mentioned San Fran and Amsterdam. Did you have a Dutch parent and an American parent? Is that how you ha- got to travel or live in between those two cities? Because I have been am- to Amsterdam once and I got a chance to go to the, the Van Gogh Museum and some of the yeah. art around the city is really amazing. And uh, so I'm thinking you had that influence from an earlier age of seeing European, yeah. Europe, you know, just a different uh, interaction with art in the community. Is that how you originally got inspired or how did you get started in art? In art, you know, I, uh, I, I had an artistic family. I liked, I don't know, I like, I loved drawing and making things as a kid. Apparently I could draw as a kid. So I was encouraged. So, you know, I kind of had like those like early positive sort of boosts coming my way. Amsterdam, I, you know, it was only in uh, hindsight that I realized that it's just like, having the contrast of uh, living in a city that has grown and arisen uh, organically over time. Like, you know, I mean, Mm. of course there's kind of a city plan like around the waterways, but basically these these are things that are a response to people coming in and environment and need and Mm. um, things aren't like so linear and uh, efficient, you know, versus like coming back to the States where things are more orderly along a grid, people are separated and encapsulated in their personal vehicles mm. and kind of, you don't really get that like rich, like organic co-mingling and cross pollination. Although when I lived in cities, um, I did feel that in like San Francisco and like as a kid in the seventies was like, you know, it was like a real like melting pot, but multicultural yeah. Um, yeah. I actually a little bit less so now because, uh, just like the shift in the sort of demographic. Yeah. Um, it's less, I, I, I find it less diverse now, but at that time it was like, you know, it was a pretty funky place. I bet. So. 
Oh my gosh. I think these things have influenced <laughs> me for sure. Yeah. And then, yeah, my, my family was uh, Dutch and Indonesian. Mm. So we have uh, like mixed heritage and my father's Norwegian. My parents met in California, which is, you know, is like every, my father immigrated here from Norway and my family left Indonesia after the war. They lived in the Netherlands for a while <clears throat> and then everybody immigrated to California. So gotcha. here I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> when, when did you like to, to get to the point to where you are now making these sort of grand installations, like really big pieces of art? How did you evolve to that? Did you start with like making something real small and then just started going, I want to make a bigger piece and a bigger piece and slowly <laughs> build up to it. Like how, it's, I, um, it's actually, I, you know, I went to, when I lived in the Bay area, I, I almost went to burning man so many times and never did. And then finally, when I was actually living in Asia for like 10 years, only then did it, I think like, Oh, I really need to go to burning man. It's like, sometimes you need the distance mm. to, for the desire to like make itself felt clearly. Mm. So I did go in uh, 2005 and I was completely blown away by, uh, first of all, the canvas, the, this natural landscape, which is so otherworldly, this like mm. white plain with these like pink mountains and there are no people around and the stars and the cosmos are just like right there, wow. like right at the, like the desert and the cosmos meet. So right, just the natural environment itself is just startlingly beautiful. And then these massive pieces that people had built in this like harsh landscape with uh, no need for identification or for acclaim. Like mm. none of the art there has a plaque. Like you don't know who the artists are. Mm. And um, it's a grueling environment. And I, I, it just blew me away. There's like beautiful art, interesting art, thoughtful art, like stupid art, humorous art, like small art, big, like on all scales. Wow. And um, I was just like this collection of human uh, creativity and imagination sort of unmitigated and not modified by the need for it to be saleable or commodified or with the intervention of like an art agent mm. or, you know, like, a monetary value attached to it. It was just like this like pure direct experience. And so you, you come upon a piece of art and you feel like you've discovered something for the first time. It's like being a kid and it's just like awestruck. Wow. And I used to have these dreams when I was quite young that um, where I was in this like plane, this field that looked a lot like the actual physical environment of Burning Man. And I, it, it was like this field of potential and I used to wake up from that and go like, what is that? And I had like a certain feeling to it. And what is this place? And like through the years, through the decades, I would think about that. And uh, when I got to Burning Man, I was like, wait, this is just like that plane. And wow. there's a feeling that goes along with it, which is that feeling. So I felt like the whole time I was there, I felt like I had this deja vu and huh. um, I had this excitation just, I, I was so struck by the art and also the generosity and the inspiration <laughs> yeah. the, yeah. of uh, like the good things of humanity, you know, that mm. whatever it was that, you know, inspired people to go through such lengths and to go to debt to share art and their thoughts, their creativity with others just for the sake of it. Um, and so that took root. Like when I actually, when I was in Mysore, like a year later, Actually, it was like nine months later. So the theme of that Burning Man was Psyche. Mm. So nine months later, I had this dream when I was in my store. It was this lucid dream. And I had I had built this like hideous, like massive <laughs> sculpture at Burning Man. <laughs> um, and it was so ugly, but I felt <laughs> so good to have done it. I was like, yes, I contributed to this like collective dream, this like uh, wow. co collaborative, creative thing this goodness and then I woke up and I you know I was really disappointed that to find that I hadn't done that and I was like <laughs> but thank god I hadn't created such a <laughs> thing. 
So I got my <laughs> sketchbook out. I was like, well, what would I do? Like, what does my eye want to see? Wow. Like, you know, and I was like, I want to see rounded forms. I want to see sort of like shapes that are more feminine. Like I want something that is a contrast to the recto, recto linearity of um, <clears throat> modern cities. I, I want something that takes away, that softens the, the grid. Um, I want, you know, light and elegance and reflective wow. surfaces. So I sketched out a few things. Like one was like actually a meditative figure, like 50 feet tall, covered with elongated androgynous, <laughs> covered inside and out with <laughs> convex mare. And then the other one was uh, Compound Eye, the one that I just uh, reinstalled at the Exploratorium. So I set those aside and I thought, wow, you know, I wish I had the skills to make those, but I don't, you know, but maybe one day somebody will. And then a few years later, I, and like, I, you know, I went to Burning Man a few other times and I like recognized I had this like longing to also do something, but I didn't have any skills. I never built anything. I was not yeah. a welder. Yeah. Um, I knew nothing, you know, I knew how to paint and draw and that was it. So I tried to focus on that, but it wasn't quite satisfying. And a few years later, I, you know, with my partner, Mitchell, I was in a fabric store in New York city. We were visiting his parents and I bought this like gorgeous, like crazy fabric. And this woman like standing next to me was like, Oh, are you going to burning man? Judging, what? judging by the fabric. you're choosing. I was like, yeah. And I was like, and so how come you're buying 25 yards of like neon colored polar fleece in August <laughs> in New York city? She's like, well, I'm an artist and this is like, I'm using this as insulation for this fragile lighting. I was like, Oh, what are you making? And wow. um, so we got in a conversation and I looked her up and she had originally been like a photographer and she was so inspired by burning. And she was like, you know, one year I just decided like I would dare myself to make something, even though I didn't have any skills. And she's like, I figured it out along the way. And she became this like incredible creator of like large scale sculptures and just like picked up skills and the right art crew along the way. And I was like, Hmm, well, if she can do it, maybe I can do it. Wow. And so I thought about that for a little while, like a year. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do as if I'm going to make a sculpture. I'm going to go through all the things I know, like send in a proposal, like look at the material, see yeah. if I can figure out who knows how to build this who knows how to build that and just do due diligence. So I did that for nine months. And by that time I had sent in a proposal. My proposal was accepted. People were like, Oh, you want to build like a thing in the desert? And I was like, yeah, I think I do. Wow. <laughs> and then it just like created its own momentum. And, you know, I thought it would be a one-off sort of like when I first went to my store, I thought, well, you know, I just want to check out this like Tubby Joy. I'll just check this out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to go to Mike for one time. And I thought, well, I want to, you know, build something at Burning Man one time. And then when it was completed, I was like, okay, this is like, this is just something different. This is like the universe, like speaking through art and it needs to be made. And uh. I, I'm going to have to do this again. I, I was like, I think I'm going to have to do this like every year. Wow. <laughs> cause this is like, cause it just felt like truth, like totally aligned. Like, yes. Yeah. Like this is, this is right. That's, um, a, that's amazing, Kirsten. I mean, you, I, yeah. I feel like first off, super inspirational because how many of us follow through with like a dream that you sketch and then finally go through all these steps to make something like this happen. Like that's pretty remarkable. I love the fact that like you have this dream, like literally, and then just like all yeah, literally. Get, get to the point where, yeah, like you have that moment of standing back, looking at the piece that you made in the desert and go, I'm doing it again next year. How, how many times, yeah. how, how many times have you done? How many installations have you done? At, um, at Burning so Man? Each, each piece I've done, I, there were things that uh, didn't go right because, you know, I mean, that's like the nice, like in, you know, summarized version. Where it's like, yes, <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I need to do it again. <laughs> but like the process of doing it and building it, it's it, like each piece that's like a, uh, this like new thing that you're creating uh, that hasn't been done before. And it's like building out in the desert wow. in like 70 mile an hour winds, like in a whiteout, 
you can't breathe because of the dust. It's like it is really intense. That's like right. it really brings okay. people to their edge. Like you, crew, uh, partners. I mean, everything financial. It's it is. You know, there are like little disasters every day, and it's like mm. you know, you lose crew members. You you other ones come your way. It's oh, like wow. everybody, you know, uh, gets into confrontation. It's really um, it's it's so intense and so challenging. Although the, there's something about that that is also like makes it so like riveting and juicy. It's like when when you go through this like ritual of like hardship. Um, I don't know. There's some, like, I suppose yeah, an aspect yeah. of, like, ancient pilgrimage or something. It's yes. like the mortification of the body. And, like, suddenly yes. there's this, like, beautiful thing that is, like, you know, it it, it has meaning for you. And then everybody else, uh, you know, people are so appreciative and excited. It's wow. like, you know, it's its own reward that keeps on giving. So That's um, really cool. I, I yeah. definitely want to go now. I have friends yeah, from here that amazing. go and they're, they're so into it and they, every year, yeah. and you know, really make a, and, I, and I've heard about, like you said, with the dust in the nose and the eyes and the intensity of the heat and dehydration and like the actual physical element of how hot it is and all that. I've heard yeah. it's just so intense. So yeah, I can't imagine actually trying to put together something <laughs> like with cranes. Yeah. <laughs> And, it is. And, and on the level yeah. that you're talking about too, where, you know, you've had to commission the funds, you've had to draw it all uh, out, get the materials, figure logistically how to get all this stuff out there. That's so amazing. Are, are, so being an artist and a yogi, yogini, yogi, uh, do you, do you see a connection between yoga and art in terms of the, posture element do you sometimes feel like you're making art with your body so to speak and the different shapes what what sort of um parallels have you experienced yeah over the years? that's an interesting question it's like uh i you know i kind of felt like sometimes they were almost dissonant like you know I would not have as much energy for my practice or there would be mornings I just was so trashed from like being on a ladder for 16 hours there was no chance I was going to practice you know it's like yeah. the art practice became the only thing yeah um but over time I you know what what there is at least for me you know and it depends on like what kind of art we're talking about is it you know, is it are we just talking about expressive art in that way? I don't think I don't see it as analogous to yoga practice, mm -hmm. uh, which I, you know, I always, for me, it's always, it starts with the inner practice. And then the, the asanas are the platform upon which to experience, refine, observe, focus, control our, um, you know, our consciousness. I mean, this is our vehicle of embodiment, our, our platform of experience. But I think a lot of asana practice is really just posture, like literally performative. And I, so, you know, it, it, I have, I do make that distinction, which I think is mm. sometimes considered a little bit uh, judgy, but I mean, I, that's just it yeah. is my perspective yeah. where, yeah. If it doesn't have the internal practice, the, the trishtana, the breath and the drishti and the bandha, then, um, you know, I think of that as more of like an ex expression of self rather than an observation and sublimation of the self. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and that's, you know, it's like fine. It's wonderful to stretch the body and feel bliss and, you know, enjoy in life. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's all great, but... I suppose it depends on the art too. Some art is just, you know, it, it, or not just, but it, it is expressively intended. Some is conceptual. Um, mm. I think it depends on who and what we're talking about. But for me, the, um, the experience of the body as this like structure in which we are gathering and absorbing information and observing information and, drawing that in and compressing it and concentrating energy and awareness and then expanding it outward and radiating outward. Uh, there just 
as like this like flow of nature, how it gathers and folds in and spirals and concentrates and then builds upon itself to like blossom outward. There is, I, I try to, or I think I bring that into mm. my um, art. It, you know, I can really just, comment on my own art so i do i uh, yeah. there's like a grounding yeah. in the art and then there's a, a quality that that grounded form holds that finite form holds the um unlimited like expressiveness or radiant potential like the infinite is captured and reflected um in a way poorly but still with intention uh, on upon those and within those finite surfaces if that makes sense. It does. You know, as you were saying that, I was re-envisioning your description of, it's called the grand eye. Is that? Uh, it's the compound eye. The compound eye. When you were explaining the yeah. compound eye and, and what you just mentioned, I felt like I was seeing your art, but also trying to relate it to the internal practices in yoga. And I, I, I feel, I see that connection. I, yeah. I, yeah. I like the way you explained it's, it. That was great. I, it's both. We're this, we're this spectrum, this finite thing, but uh, there's this unlimitedness, there's like bright light, this radiant potential uh, that, that we hold that we're, that, you know, we're not separate from the source, or at least I don't think we are. So, uh, you know, it's sort of my personal filter uh, with practice and with art. So in that sense, trying to perhaps present that, maybe wow. not express it, but, yeah. you know, reflect yeah. that or offer that perhaps. That is really cool. You're, you're making me want to create something. Like I, I, yeah. feel like I, I want to be, <laughs> I feel, I've always told myself I'm horrible at art, which is the worst thing to ever do is tell yourself no. a, a negative affirmation. Cause of course it's not going to inspire me to do work or artwork, but I, yeah. uh, just that this idea of trying attempting to create something that would reflect the way that you're seeing the world and or your what you're thinking about that's that's incredible do you you made mention that that one another thing that kind of seemed to stick out for me is when you said that the energy of being out at burning burning man and how much it felt like pure art because there was like a little bit less of that say commissioning and or doing it for yeah. someone else and or going around the the dealers so to speak and actually just putting something out there and then obviously we have a lot of discussions or there's lots of discussions about like the commercialization of yoga and or what what in yeah. your mind would be like pure yoga you know if we were to remove the the desire to like say have the right outfit for when i go to class and or to um you know go that that deeper layer into it is there a way to explain that or is there a way to describe what a pure form of yoga is, I feel like you've already, you're doing a great job already of, of helping me to see that, that side of it. But, um, what do you notice in, in terms of the yoga world? And when we see that like commercialization, how do you, what do you do to try to stay out of that or keep it fresh or keep it feeling like it's legit? Wow. That is, uh, yeah, that has uh, many different answers. I, okay. <laughs> for myself, I mean, you know, we're humans and we're products and we're always in response and in influence in our environment. We can't extricate ourselves from that, but yeah. just, you know, keeping that uh, sharpness of the, you know, like, okay, what am I, what am I practicing for? And like, you know, saying, I mean, for, this is what I do, you know, like, uh -huh. is this, is my uh, motivation for doing this? Is it image or ego driven? Am I looking for attention? Uh, do I want it to be like pretty or do I want to look be noticed? Uh, is, is any of that happening? And if so, uh, what do I need to do to, uh, you know, I don't need to like wing the pendulum and go the other way because I've noticed over the years that that doesn't work for people, for me or for mm -hmm. students, uh, for fellow teachers. Um, but just like, just don't do the thing that is like grasping towards something. Yeah, um, that makes sense. You know, yeah. um, 
like that. I yeah. always, um, whether I'm teaching by myself or with like a teaching partner, we try to just um, only offer what we know and which, you know, isn't everything where you know, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. I, I don't presume to offer this. I do not. Uh, I, I'm put off by a sort of hierarchical relationships. I do not want to be somebody's advisor. Uh, you know, it's yeah. like always bringing it back to something that other teachers have said and that I've really appreciated where they mm-hmm. refer to themselves only as a, like some it's, it's students, like always remembering that mm-hmm. as a, you're not a teacher, you're a student of yoga. You're, it's a lifelong practice and you're learning things along the way. Yeah. Perhaps through direct experience, you've learned more hopefully than somebody who hasn't practiced as long. And so Whatever those things are that you've learned along the way, you offer those and without embellishment yeah, um, and without filler. And that'll have to be enough. And if yeah. people want more, there are other teachers who mm. are offering more or something different. And then that's fine. Just yeah. allowing for that. But like not territorializing students or claiming students, uh, not demanding that somebody has like obeisance or loyalty to you. Um, I, I think those are those are sort of uh, difficult constructs and I think they can they lend themselves to like toxic uh, hierarchical yeah. relationships. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, I don't know. I just uh, trying to stay humble and keep it real and be grounded and available. I always try to set time aside to actually meet students uh, as fellow humans and not hold the space of like, well, I'm the teacher and you're the student and there's a chasm and we're, <laughs> we're just never going to reach that. Um, so, yeah, I think keeping things simple and modest in whatever way that is meaningful. I like that. I, I, yeah. um, I, I agree. I think the simple part is such a big one. Like, like the other day when I was, I was practicing and I was feeling like in the forward bends and the murchiasanas and the twists, I felt like all I'm doing is just folding and squeezing and pressing and squeezing and folding. And, yeah. and if I keep it really simple like that, I feel like I'm more connected to it somehow than yeah. I try to make it elaborate and like there's more to it than there really is. I don't know. Somehow I agree. I think the simple part is a big thing. Yeah. We're just these patterns that are folding and unfolding. We're nature moving in towards the center or radiating out from the center or both simultaneously happening. And I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much uh, it. It seems that people's attention spans sometimes lacks in the ability to like practice series of yoga poses, for example, like the primary series or second series, like doing the same thing over and over again. Sometimes I hear people say that they get bored and yeah, yeah like personally, I love repetition and I feel like it, it helps me to stay motivated and, and keeps me on track. And I don't really feel like I, I have to create something new. Like I, I don't yeah. feel like I, I need to do that. Um, I just like kind of enjoy doing the repetition. Uh, do you think yeah. that from the angle of an artist, like sometimes if you were copying someone's artwork, maybe someone would say to you like, well, you're not an original artist. And by by mimicking poses and doing the same thing over and over in some ways, like am I a copycat in my yoga practice? Like I sometimes wonder like, should I be creating something new but then I think that I, I've heard that saying in art that nothing is new is created under the sun what 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 are your thoughts in terms of like replication and or attempting to be original okay uh well with <laughs> yeah that's a good question um so it, for art I think you know it's sort of if somebody is like simply copying an outer form in art then uh, then that is that somebody else uh, has expressed 
correct, then there is, then it's empty of content and it's just an outer form. It's hollow. Mm. Um, if it's something that's expressed and it happens to overlap with somebody else's expression, uh, then we go back to, I mean, at least what I believe is like, ultimately there is nothing original. There's, we're mm. all stemming from the same source and creative, uh, trust, uh, that, you know, the, the cosmos, uh, you know, the, this is, it, it's all derivative of the cosmos. And mm. like, I, I noticed that certain artists will like tap into maybe like a certain section of the, you know, the great, imaginative pies <laughs> the, yeah, the yeah, universe yeah. gives us. Um, I notice sometimes I have ideas that I haven't done and like, I think, well, I'm going to do that eventually. And then somebody else does the exact same thing. Mm. And so what that point, what That's I think about that is just like, we're, you know, we're human. Humans are filters. Like, you know, I, I am looking for certain things. I'm drawn to certain things. I like to express certain things. And I'm not so unique as a human that only I would, would you know, of like 7 billion people, like, you know, I would be the only one. That's ridiculous. You right, know, it's like right. there, we're more similar than dissimilar. And there, I think there is no separation. We're all, you know, facets of this compound eye, you know. Yeah. So yep, we're, yep. we're, yeah, that's, you know, another artist like does that thing before you do then. Well, great. Then you don't have to do it. Like you can focus on like the other things that you want to do. That's how I see it. Um, if somebody is like literally copying what you're doing because they think it looks cool, not because like they, it, it, they drew it from deep inside themselves. then that's a different thing than that's right. plagiar, plagiarizing. And yeah, I don't think that's okay. Okay, so yoga um, and the sameness, the repetition of the practice is, I mean, that the, the boredom is there as a tool for us to learn mm. to see how we are in, in response to boredom or mm. discomfort or, um, you know, it's like, are we drawn to this asana because we look good in it? We want to luxuriate because it feels blissful. We, uh, you know, we're awesome at back bends. Uh, we've got that special piece of back bend or whatever it is. Like, yeah. looking for attention. Are we avoiding something? <clears throat> you know, I noticed there's like two, re two negative or resistant responses, like either like a somebody is like aware of an asana that's coming up that they don't like. And so they're already putting energy into it before they're even in that moment. Or the other one is like avoidance. Like once they're in the asana, just like quickly kind of doing it and yeah. hoping like nobody noticed and you just <laughs> kind of skim over it, which, you know, I mean, this, this is what we do with our practices, but through doing these things and the sameness, the, rep the repetitiveness, we get to learn what our character structure is like are mm. we are we resistant or are we avoidant do we tend to grasp are we greedy for like attention or um, acknowledgement and so you get to see what you're like it gets the repetition creates this mirror um, and as you change over time you know of course your physicality changes the body becomes stronger or more flexible or you, you start eating better you know whatever like all of those things but it's also um as those changes happen what what is left for us to observe is like how our mental structure deals with situations and I, these are just templates for us to learn about ourselves and hope mm. of course hopefully take it off the map like well rather than avoiding a situation which is uncomfortable for us can we use the inner practice that hopefully we've been cultivating and refining and strengthening all this time, the breathing through the discomfort, like being okay with like riding the edge of discomfort, um, being able to differentiate whether this is like discomfort or pain, you know, and in that case, like we should pull ourselves out, like, you know, and just, it's just like polishing the lens, like seeing mm -hmm. who we are. And then it's up to us to do the work to kind of balance our nature, you know? Mm. And so I, I, yeah, I tended because of the, um, 
you know, if we're looking at it from an Ayurvedic perspective, like somebody who has like a, uh, a, a fair amount of uh, vata in their like character structure, which I do, um, I was resistant to the same as like, I wanted the novelty. I wanted something different. I wanted yeah. to play. I, I hated getting up like at the same time. And then, but I recognized that the, this rather than like giving into um, that, that I, it perhaps there might be a usefulness to balancing out that aspect of my nature. So by giving it the challenge of discipline, I was able to kind of bridge the gap between the side that wants novelty and the side that, uh, you know, benefits from discipline. And I think that's what we're trying to do with like a yoga practice to balance those. It's extreme to call it a shadow side, but those sort of unrealized aspects of ourselves and to, you know, it's like building a muscle. So, People are like, oh, this is so boring. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it's supposed to, this part, <laughs> at some point, you're going to hit upon the phase where you're super bored and you have to just, that's your challenge. It's not like, oh, it's yeah. always going to be fun and blissful. It's like, no, it's yeah. going to be boring. Can you still continue practice? And hopefully, like, use the inter- yoga tristana, like, has, you have, one has cultivated a bit of uh, dispassion. So, you're not attached, you know, mm. you're in a pose you love. Yeah. Five breaths are finished. Next year. You're, no, you're in a pose that you hate. Five breaths are finished. Just showing up in the moment, yeah. doing the thing, watching it, observing yourself. And then you can decide with like greater awareness, like with how you choose to respond rather than sort of being slung and like enslaved by reaction. Like I hate this. I don't want to do this. You know, I love this. I want to hang out and luxuriate. And this is like, (laughs) just like, yeah, I hate this. Whatever. Next. I love this. Yeah. Okay. Done. (laughs) Over. What's next? And so you just kind of, you know, watch yourself uh, and your mind in response and kind of, it it gives you a sense of humor about it. You know, it's just our humanness. That's cool, Kirsten. That's a great answer. It made me, the way you were explaining the ability to override or just to observe like that, and then when you're explaining like being out in the desert and trying to put something together in 70 mile an hour winds and the heat, like a similarity between that approach in the art yeah. and also in the, the <laughs> yoga side. And it, I, it does serve, yeah. It, it gets you through those hard spaces and you just breathe <laughs> through. And then you're like, okay, we we solved some problems. We got through that. It was really intense, and I wouldn't want to repeat it. But, you know, it's like <laughs> you can do it if, if needed. <laughs> if needed. So. Uh, man, Kirsten, I'm so thankful for you taking time to speak with me. I... I I had, um, I had asked Cliff, I said, uh, man, I, I, who could I interview? And he's like, you gotta, you gotta reach out to, to Kirsten. She's really amazing. And, and I feel, uh, Beautiful. so thankful to, to have this chance. I know we've been working on being able to, uh, have this, uh, <laughs> discussion for, for a little while now. And, and yeah. I'm really glad that it came together and I'm, I'm just so thankful for you to take some time out of your day. And I love hearing, uh, like from an artist perspective, like, um, I don't know the way you explained the last piece that you just reinstalled. That was r- really cool. And I feel, I feel inspired. I want to, I want to get some hubcaps <laughs> and like yeah. uh, throw something together. I don't know. <laughs> just get some materials. Like, you know, it's, it's, that, it, and in that way, it is like a yoga practice. You just, you set aside some space and like most of what's going to happen in that space is going to be pretty mediocre, but sometimes you like create something that's like, you're, you surprise yourself and sometimes you create something that's awful and you just, you do it anyway and like, you know, allow for the full spectrum of, uh, you know, expression to happen and, you know, some, something will come through that, uh, speaks to you and it's like so in that way it's you you get the aha just like you do in practice on occasion and also with art but it's yeah it's delightful i love the questions these are so uh, thoughtful and interesting so it's it's really been a joy to have this conversation i appreciate it thank you kirsten so much well i i hope i know we're 
waiting for everything to kind of get back to the usual stuff. But um, <clears throat> I, I hope to get a chance to practice with you sometime somewhere. It, it would be a pleasure. Love it. We can continue the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. Never ending conversation. That's yeah. right. Right. Thank I know. You. I'm like, I'm looking at, I, I, I was watching the, the time, like going, I, I want to keep going, but <laughs> maybe we can do it again in the future. We can have a part two. Sure. Yeah. Why not? I'd love it. Thank you so Delightful. much, Kirsten. We'll have a, yeah, a, a, my pleasure. a wonderful day and you too. take care. Yeah. Thanks. Thank thanks you. So much, Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that. If you held off on looking at Kirsten's Instagram page, go ahead now and check out at K-I-R-S-T-B-E-R-G and now have a look at what she's talking about. Whoa, man, some crazy stuff. So cool. Thank you, Kirsten. I really appreciate you taking the time. That was great. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day and until next time. Thank you so much for joining our discussion today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to give credit to the music, Bryce Allen Band. Thank you so much for making us some fresh sounds for us. Check them out, BryceAllenBand.com. Remember, you can visit us at nativeyogacenter.com. I have a special for live stream. If you, no matter where you live, you can join with us some yoga classes and you can try us out two weeks free. Go on our website, nativeyogacenter.com. On the homepage, there's a link. Try live stream two weeks free. Click it and off you're off and running. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Until next time, be well.